everyone. Um, welcome to our session on uh, Linux Foundation and sustainability. My name is Hillary Carter, and uh, I um, launched the research program at the Linux Foundation uh, in 2021. And we have uh, done a number of research projects that are uh, focused um, on the intersection between open source and sustainability, and we're excited to tell you more about them. And I'm joined by my colleague, Anna Hermanson from LF Research. Anna, I'll let you introduce yourself too. Um, so, hi everyone. As Hillary mentioned, I am working with her on the, in the research department. I'm the ecosystem manager and I also run uh, some of our research. I've done some research in Hyperledger for the blockchain community and I'm currently working on a healthcare project, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, it's really great to be here and I'm really excited to share more about what we're doing. Thanks, Anna. All right, so we'll kick off. Um, why are we here talking about open source and sustainability. Why is open source so uh, valuable when it comes to accelerating uh, sustainable objectives or sustainable development goals? Um, we're not the first to recognize the value proposition for open source as a sustainability accelerator. In fact, uh, one of the first notable mentions was by the United Nations Global Compact in 2017, who made the connection that open source would be instrumental in helping achieve uh, the 2030 agenda, which is uh, essentially what the United Nations SDGs uh, aim to um, address. But not only helping uh, accelerate the goals, um, sustainability can be uh, valuable to, to bringing a new business. Uh, innovation is not always um, uh, a non-profitable uh, activity, it can add a lot of economic value as well. And they attributed, the UN Global Compact attributed a $2.1 trillion in a net new revenue for the technology sector um, by advancing uh, open source innovations. So that was really exciting. But why is it, what is it that open source does uh, that relates to sustainability? Essentially, it's the opportunity to eliminate waste and duplication. Um, the barrier to entry for innovation that drive the goals is, is lowered because of the lowering the total cost of ownership of open source projects um, is enabled through um, the licensing model. Um, there is no need for a new cloud container orchestration system because one already exists. Um, during COVID, we found that there were numerous innovations trying to address the COVID-19 um, pandemic uh, that were launched simultaneously. So there was a lot of duplication at the early end of the innovation cycle. But as projects mature, uh, the opportunities for duplication and waste in innovation are simultaneously reduced. So that is essentially what the opportunities for open source. It is, value, it, it is viewed um, as a digital public good. And these goods span the spectrum of collaboration, open standards, open source software, open hardware, open content, and open AI models. Um, and so they are vital elements uh, to achieving sustainability along with, uh, with other uh, factors. So why the Linux Foundation? Well, we are proud stewards of more than 1,000 technology projects. Um, open source code is present in 80 to 90% of all global digital infrastructure. And uh, our technologies enable the functionality of the global digital economy. And we also enable the functionality of innovations um, in a sustainability context. Um, so we are the home to uh, sustain these technologies. Um, we provide the legal structures, um, the the um, collaboration frameworks, the governance frameworks, most importantly, to allow continued openness in technologies and to make sure that when designers are making an architecture choice, they can choose open source that is hosted under a foundation model with a lot of confidence. It gets a lot harder to change the license 
when you have open governance and when you have certainty and clarity that your technologies are openly governed, then you can embed those technologies in your design decisions. So that's the heart of what we do and how it, uh, how it relates to uh, sustainability. So a year ago at Open Source Summit North America, which was hosted in Vancouver, we uh, launched um, a, a portal right on Linux Foundation's homepage that would help direct uh, visitors to learn more about how um, our technologies were aligned with uh, the UN SDGs, uh, which goals we were um, very active in, where there were gaps. And uh, it's here that we publish sustainability specific research reports. We identify events and, and content streams like Sustainability Con. So if you're interested in understanding what's next on the event calendar, uh, you can find sustainability specific events here. You can learn about the individual projects and project communities that were both born with sustainability at their core as part of their mission and vision statement, projects like LF Energy, um, Green Software Foundation, uh, OS Climate, AgStack Foundation, and others, as well as those projects that were created for other purposes, yet whose applications are, uh, in, are advancing sustainable goals in tremendous ways. Um, communities like the Hyperledger Foundation or the Zephyr Project. The use of those technologies in sustainable applications is really quite inspiring. Um, even before we created uh, LF Sustainability as a place to go to learn more, we as an organization needed to, to understand the, the extent of our projects and how they were connected with these common goals, which might have been intentional or unintentional. But we needed to understand ourselves. What do we have here that's valuable? And what was really exciting is we set about uh, to create a research project that would um, engage in, in qualitative interviews and really understand where uh, our strengths were, we, where we had a lot of um, uh, presence and um, we were answering critical questions, not just about the tech stacks themselves, but about the communities around those stacks. Uh, what were the DEI initiatives uh, that were created around technical projects? Um, what are the working groups? Uh, how can people get involved? How are they getting involved uh, in sustainable activities at the Linux Foundation? Um, we also host the landscape of LF Energy specific projects here on the sustainability page uh, and lots more. And I think among the surprising findings, at least for me, oh, I'll, I'll I know where I'm going and uh, I'll get there eventually. So changing tactics. Um, one of the community events that we uh, are promoting currently on our sustainability page is the OSPOs for Good Symposium, which is hosted by the United Nations in partnership with organizations like Open Forum Europe and OSPO++. Uh, Linux Foundation is on the uh, communications committee and will be speaking at the event. It takes place in New York City on the 9th and 10th of July and uh, it will be a place to convene leaders from all over the world uh, to describe how the open source program office as a structure can help create new networks for global digital collaboration. What's very exciting is there is a very strong movement in Europe to establish OSPOs across European govern governments and regions and uh, to, to encourage the use of open source technologies first before closed source uh, software, where there's um, sentiment that public money should equate to public code. And it's this kind of thinking um, that uh, is, is very prolific in Europe, less so in North America, um, but the use of public code by default takes place in the global south because uh, many countries simply do not have the resources to uh, procure closed source solutions. They have no other alternative but to use open source. So these are the kinds of conversations that will be taking place, how open source is, is an accelerator to collaboration, uh, and where are the greatest opportunities to innovate in this area. 
The LF energy landscape, uh, you'll see here, uh, we encourage anyone with uh, projects to include them in this landscape. Uh, it was created by, um, uh, internally, my colleague John Murdoch, um, who's program manager at LF Energy, uh, initiated the landscape. And we anticipate that um, at some point in time, we would have a sustainability landscape that would include all the energy projects, uh, uh, all the Linux Foundation projects. Uh, it's quite a grandiose idea, uh, but you get the picture. Landscapes are really quite effective to see which particular projects are advancing which um, uh, solutions and in which contexts. A research report is available here, Open Source for Sustainability, and this describes how um, uh, projects across the Linux Foundation are accelerating the UN SDGs where there are uh, opportunities to do more and to hopefully encourage more people to get involved. The questions that we used to create the report was, first, does the open source asset allow users to make progress to one or more goals? Um, what were the use cases launched or in development by the project? And secondly, as I alluded to previously, does the project or its organization uh, as a community, as an ecosystem, uh, help to advance the goals through documented uh, efforts um, by its contributors or its working groups? So uh, a twofold approach. The overwhelming conclusion was that all of our projects at the LF uh, accelerate goal nine, which is industry innovation and infrastructure on the basis that you need not replicate what already exists. Um, and CNCF being a, a terrific example of that, like the community hosts more than 150 unique projects. It, um, it is really providing the, the basic infrastructure for any cloud computing um, and is a fundamental building block for uh, innovation in, in um, the age of cloud. What other projects uh, are, are worth notable mention uh, and how they align with which goals? Uh, so goal one is no poverty. And uh, one of the uh, use cases from the Hyperledger Foundation um, identifies the National Bank of Cambodia um, uh, working with the Hyperledger technologies on a project called the Bakong Project um, in collaboration with Hyperledger member Soramitsu. And this project allows um, the people of, of um, Cambodia to access the payment system. 70% of uh, Cambodians are uh, what we call unbanked. And so goal one about uh, no poverty uh, is really about bringing people into the financial system, whether they have a bank account or not. And the reason many people in this world don't have bank accounts, it's not because they don't have assets, it's because they don't have an identity. Uh, that is required to access uh, banking services. Know your client is rooted in what's your name, when are you born, and show me your documentation. Uh, but we're, if you're able to bring a critical mass of population into the financial system so that people can transact with your phone, that's the first step in allowing people to receive uh, remuneration for any kind of product or service that they themselves are creating um, and receive microfinance as well. Uh, goal six, uh, clean water and sanitation, another hyperledger uh, solution in collaboration with Fujitsu on management of uh, water facilities, um, reducing agriculture production waste um, and improving um, how water is filtered and refined um, and so on. Goal six is one of the areas we have um, the second fewest number of open source projects uh, that are linked to the goals. The other is uh, SDG 14, Life Below Water. So two water-focused projects of all of them. And I point that out because um, we associate the health of the planet with um, the green movement, uh, but the blue movement is is equally important because 50% of the world's oxygen is derived from, from the ocean and life that lives on the ocean producing half of our oxygen. So if there's no blue, there's no green. And that's why we need to be equally minded about um, preserving life below or just on the surface of our, uh, our, our waters. 
and making sure that everyone has access to clean drinking water is a fundamental um, human right. Goal seven, affordable and clean energy. This is driven largely by the projects hosted under LF Energy, uh, projects like Sonio, um, uh, Operator Fabric, uh, Grid Exchange Fabric, um, Everest. There's the, the mission of LF Energy is to advance the electrification of our world and use open source technologies to uh, make that happen. And uh, uh, goal 15, life on land. This was um, this came through loud and clear in some of the applications uh, and deployments of the Zephyr project, the real-time operating system, which has found its way onto um, a caribou. Um, uh, I want to say there's the word for lots of caribou. <laughs> I'm at a loss for words. Um, monitoring caribou um, movements in uh, northern Scandinavia. Herds, that's, that's the word, thank you. Uh, caribou herds, as well as monitoring um, uh, the very endangered white rhinoceros in Zimbabwe. So being able to monitor livestock, their movements, wildlife, not just livestock, but wildlife, and track their movements and ensure that they have every opportunity to survive and thrive is enabled by Zephyr. And it's uh, an incredibly inspiring use case. So we're really excited about that. And then now I want to invite Anna Hermanson up on stage because she's going to do a deep dive in uh, goal three, uh, researching open source in healthcare. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Hillary. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'd like to give a bit of a dive into one of the work we're doing right now that is related to Sustainable Development Goal 3, which is good health and well-being. As Hillary mentioned, and as we've seen today in this presentation, um, sustainability is not just about uh, the environment or climate change. There's also aspects of it that are maybe don't come to mind as immediately, but something like good health and well-being that provides direct benefit to the people that have good health and well-being, but it also provides indirect benefit, um, you know, from a health economics perspective. If we have good health, we, um, you know, we are more productive, we have a less of a strain on the GDP of our countries, and so there is a, a larger indirect benefit to health as well. So first, a bit of an overview of the projects that we discovered in the work we did with the sustainability project that are related to healthcare. Uh, as Hillary mentioned, we had quite a few projects that were directly built for specific sustainability effects and purposes, but we also had projects like Hyperledger um, that were built with more of a general purpose and have since been applied in really interesting ways. And so, Hyperledger, for example, has been used in uh, patient-centered health data management and um, OpenJS Foundation as well with a um, remote electronic health record monitoring application. Um, we do have uh, projects that are primarily meant for healthcare and, and, and well-being. So that would be ELISA, which is the use of Linux in safety applications. And then also Call for Code supports a number of projects that are used in emergency, emergency management. And so just a, a, a highlight of, of the projects that we have in healthcare. We, of course, don't have a, bo a body that supports all of these healthcare initiatives like an LF Energy, um, but uh, there are a number of projects that do support health and well-being. Uh, zooming in a little bit on uh, health data, um, I I'd like to feature PyTorch uh, as a, a project within the LF that is doing a lot of great work in that health researchers are using to do a lot of great work in health research. These are just four headlines from Nature articles. Um, PyTorch is being used to help automate the detection of, um, uh, I forget the word, leukocytes um, for uh, uh, blood disorders. It's been using uh, used to analyze clinical photographs for um, uh, to analyze placentas and any sort of um, pregnancy issues. Um, and so there, there's a lot of great applications of PyTorch in the healthcare space that are being used right now. Despite this innovation and despite all the work that's being done, um, this is a, a quote from the research we're doing right now, which I'll explain in a minute. But um, 
there's still people suffering and dying, and a lot of that has, has to do or could be prevented by having greater uh, health data management systems. Um, a lot of this work is crucial to, for researchers and for academics and uh, healthcare providers to provide better care, to not have such duplicative care, and to better support patients. And so we thought that this represents a really great open source opportunity, um, especially because it relates to these technologies and, and how to better have healthcare technology. And so we decided to ask the research question, how has the healthcare se sector actually used open source, uh, particularly when it comes to capturing and interpreting healthcare data? So we, we've been running a qualitative research project. I'll just quickly go through the methodology. Um, this involves a literature review where uh, we're scanning. Uh, I, I did a literature review on, on PubMed, and I looked for the use of open source in electronic health records. So creating this will help us create a landscape of the tooling that's being used in open source, in healthcare that is open source tooling. And we're also in the middle of running a number of interviews with subject matter experts, primarily with technologists because um, they have that kind of understanding of, of open source and where the technology is needed, but also with some healthcare providers. And we're now at the point of uh, doing data analysis on these interviews and the literature review. And so, as I mentioned, we're creating this list of tooling and we're also coding uh, our findings to create out themes for the research. And so I am about, I'll go through some of those preliminary findings. These are very preliminary. Um, they're building, I'm building these kind of as we go. We're still running research on this project, but uh, I'd like to give a, a few key findings from the project. So the first, um, as I'm sure some of us in this room know, there is a small handful of large incumbents like Epic and Cerner that are really monopolizing the electronic health record space. Um, the, the individuals I've spoken to have either said, this is kind of an inevitability. You know, we have, I spoke to someone that is using open source in an AI capacity and um, they, uh, you know, at the end of the interview, they said, but we're also moving to Epic. So there's a lot of, of focus on Epic and Cerner and it being almost an ine inevitability or um, it being kind of the one of the only options, especially in, in the U.S. with, with Epic. Um, and so also these, this theme of this consolidation around the, the monopoly of these few, these few uh, incumbents. Um, despite this uh, consolidation and what you may be able to think of as a standardization around one healthcare system or one, one technology, uh, these systems, you know, as we all know as patients in, this, in our healthcare systems, they do not interoperate, they are not standardized, and they don't align very well with clinical processes. A lot of uh, pr pr uh, healthcare professionals struggle with the use of EHRs and having to um, integrate them into their, into their clinical process. As you can see in that bottom quote, the implementation is not necessarily thought through in terms of how a doctor or nurse may want to use um, the health record system. And then there's also, um, you know, we've, we've spoken to individuals that say almost interoperability is dead. It's not used properly anymore because uh, vendors use this term uh, to, to say that they're interoperable, but even the standards that are being applied in these spaces um, are almost, uh, the standard is being applied in a unique way. And so there, there lacks interoperability, despite the fact that they're, they say they're using a standard like FHIR. Um, and so, despite uh, how broken it is, these vested interests and incentives actually keep this system broken. Um, we've heard from a lot of individuals that are frustrated by the lobbying nature. At least this, uh, this is focused on the United States, um, but particularly in the U.S., the, the lobbying that happens that, that places Epic and Cerner at the center of um, um, of, of hospital decisions around um, procuring technology. And the incentive structure is, is one where these hospitals want to keep their patients and so that interoperability is not an incentive for hospitals and technologists. 
Uh, moving over to some open source themes, the that we see common open source concerns in this space, where especially in this industry where uh, risk aversion is extremely high. You know, you have life life or death situations, and so um, there's a, a lack of willingness to experiment. And open source is seen as experimental at times and and more innovative than hospitals may think they need. And so if they um, uh, there are these requirements and liabilities, for example, HIPAA, and uh, there's a concern that if it's an open source solution, they won't have the um, they won't have the ability to point the finger and say who do I who do I turn to, or as as one of our interviewees said, there's nobody to sue, and so there's concerns around open source and liability, and then um, also the fact that there are some. Um, there's maybe a lack of ability to uh, to implement and to maintain open source solutions. Um, I'm trying to get a little more positive. Um, so open source, as a few of our, our interviews have, have brought up to us, it has taken hold in areas where we see more bottom-up innovation. Um, the, there has been a lot of innovation with open source in the Global South. Um, I have a map in a minute that I'll show you. And um, I also spoke to someone who worked on an open source implementation in the 80s, and uh, he mentioned, you know, we've had this heyday of bottom-up decentralized um, healthcare systems, uh, again, with this kind of centralized, um, as he said, vice grip coming down to, to try and strangle that, but um, that innovation was still there and happened because it was, it was really needed in that specific space at that time. And so it, it happens where, you know, hospitals, patients, uh, uh, health care providers really need that kind of solution and don't, ne can't, don't necessarily turn to Epic or Cerner for the solution. So this is the, the map I mentioned. We, this is the I, uh, UNITU has put together a digital exchange portal. And this shows, this was filtered for healthcare applications because the, the portal looks at all public sector uses of open source. Um, and so this is the, the number of healthcare implementations and as you can see it's quite heavily focused on Africa and um, a little bit of Asia and very less in the north there are it looks like there's 50 in the United States but um, as you can see the open source innovation is really concentrated at least in the healthcare space in um, the global south uh, so there, there's an impetus to fix the, the, the system. Uh, there's a lot of entrenched issues and challenges, but we are seeing more open source momentum, as I just showed in, in the Global South, and innovation in Europe. So as people are seeing how dysfunctional this is, there's a cry for, for changing the system. And um, the European Union, Union, as some of our interviews pointed out, is um, really working on how to actually create a, a, a standard governance system where health data can work together and are embracing open source solutions such as open EHR, which one interviewee uh, mentioned. Uh, and so as a lot of us in this room and at this conference know, open source provides a really important alternative uh, that can provide greater collaboration, uh, sustainability and interoperability that is really needed in this, in this system. Um, I had an individual who I was interviewing use the term Lego bricks, which we saw, um, I probably shouldn't say Lego, we might get sued, but um, building blocks, I guess we could say, um, which we also saw in our, um, in our sustainability report. And so um, this kind of modularity has become so important in the healthcare space where despite Epic and Cerner and, and uh, Altera's kind of monolithic applications, there is a lot of need for flexibility and customization. And so the open source modular approach is, is, um, uh, would, will, is quite useful in this space. Um, and just a, a comment, as we've been talking a lot about trust today and how open source um, leads to, but also requires more trust. Um, I did have a, a, a nice conversation with someone who spoke to that that trust aspect of when you open source uh, software technology, that trust comes in, developers want to work on it. And um, trust is such a huge problem in the healthcare space, not trusting vendors and this kind of um, gridlock of, of incent broken incentives. And so um, open source, even um, from an ethos or mindset perspective, brings in that trust again. 
So just a, a final few slides. Um, you know, we, as, I've, as I've pointed out today, we have this dysfunctional healthcare system, not just in the United States. Uh, we're seeing it in other um, areas of the world where I'm interviewing individuals. And so, you know, coming back to why we have all this open source um, technology, how can we apply it in um, kind of the healthcare perspective to create better outcomes for individuals and economies? So that is the last of the slides. Um, as this is, generally speaking, if you have a sustainability-focused project, if you're applying um, technologies and softwares in a, in a healthcare perspective, in, as Hillary mentioned, we're, we're lacking applications in um, the water-based SDGs. So we'd love to hear from you. Um, please connect with us. You can come find us at the conference or find us online. And I think that's it. Thanks. Yeah, any questions for Hillary or I? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll just repeat the question. Um, you've asked if we were looking, our, our research is quite US focused and we're looking at um, Europe or, I mean, I'm, I'm Canadian and did my, my studies in healthcare in Canada. So looking at other jurisdictions. Um, yeah, yeah, I think the, the theme or what we're really finding from interviewing Americans is that the system is so broken here and I think turning to the EU potentially Canada the UK and saying um, you know how are they doing it there is it what's working better there and um, so I, we have interviewed I interviewed an individual in um, Lithuania uh, and I've also spoken to someone who works in in Ireland and for the, the government of Ireland and he also has experience in the US and the UK so um, and then I've spoken to a number of Canadians as well from from my past experience in healthcare so I think that's probably a good step for us is how can we look at other sectors and uh, or other jurisdictions and apply what they're doing there um, and not necessarily have the same outcomes in the U.S. because it is such a different system from public uh, public systems. But yeah, I think that's a good point. conversations around the implementation of open source software. Um, yeah, I th so the question was, do we, are we having our conversations around the implementations in, in these kind of global South countries? Um, yeah, so the, the individual that um, shared this resource with me has spoken to a few implementations in Africa and is, um, I'm trying to get in, in touch with one of them to have a conversation about how they implemented the, um, the open source system there. I think the the learnings are, I think the, the systems are a bit different because we have these really entrenched players in in the States, in Canada, and, and in the EU, for, EU for, for a certain extent. But I think the, um, the learnings from how they've implemented and how they've kind of leapfrogged those those um, more entrenched players would be really an interesting use case for us to highlight. So that's definitely a, um, an aim of the research is, um, and someone I'm, I'm also uh, speaking to someone who works in India on an, an open source healthcare project. So we'd like to highlight these kind of different um, best practices or positive use cases because this is kind of negative research, but um, lots of, there's, lo uh, it's also a lot, there's also potential, so. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. In the
Right. Um, I not particularly. I've done some research in the blockchain gaming space, but I, in terms of sustainability, um, no. We we are running a research project on um, decentralized computing, and um, I think that could be an interesting sustainability angle, looking at how we can run uh, more kind of edge computing and not be so reliant on big large servers. Um, but we haven't come across. I don't think we've. Did you find any gaming? Yeah, but yeah, thank you for for bringing that to our attention. Yeah, sure. Uh, we are seeing across open source project communities the need for uh, more green uh, compute at Cloud Native Computing Foundation projects with Red Hat, um, uh, smarter hardware that is able to run in resource constrained environments. And I think that's what the Zephyr project is really driving is that it's designed for um, the minimal use of resources. And we need to accelerate that thinking by bringing smarter um, hardware, smarter software. Um, and I have not heard the gaming industry respond to the, the um, or it did not come up as something that was uh, a priority to address, but that's not to say that it doesn't exist. It's definitely worth exploring further. So thank you for, for bringing it to our attention. Yeah. I think a little, so the question was if we're seeing a push for interoperability because of health research mandates to have data available. Um, I think we're seeing it a little bit. There is, uh, I mean, even just the use of the word interoperable comes up a lot in, in um, vendors saying that they are interoperable. Um, I think the, the challenge is in how to kind of how to get around privacy concerns, or not get around, but how to create systems that are privacy preserving and use those systems. And I mean, we were in a, a confidential computing session yesterday Yesterday, where, where Sal, one of the, the technical community architect there, spoke about um, the use of confidential computing for NIH sharing cancer uh, research data. Um, but I don't think I've, I think there's, there's been a push for digitizing healthcare, but I think the the push has, as I heard from one interviewee, the push was to use specific vendors um, to digitize, and so it still seems that there's this this block where the incentive system is set up for them to not share their data because they lose money if they if they create an interoperable system. In terms of a, it would be, I think I've only really spoken to, well, one individual at a public center, but it would be interesting to speak to um, a more academic research perspective in the healthcare space because, I mean, from, from my experience in research in healthcare, the data is still very hard to access, but there is kind of, um, at least in Canada, there were kind of understandings between different jurisdictions to try and get data faster. So I think it's, it's, it's moving a little bit, but definitely at least in the private sector, still very, in, in US private sector, still very broken, so. Yeah. Um, I wanna come back to your question because I've had a bit of a eureka. <laughs> this was a question about gaming and what kind of conversations or initiatives are taking place in the gaming industry. We happen to have done some research um, specific to the non-fungible tokens space with the Hyperledger Foundation. And NFTs are assets that are used in a gaming context. 
in fact, the digital world in which those assets may reside um, is in itself a type of, uh, of digital asset. And the research that we did was that not all non-fungible tokens, not all protocols are equally um, uh, negative in terms of it, their uh, uh, carbon footprint that we can make improved architecture choices when we're designing designing gaming environments and there are numerous protocols many uh, one of which is a uh, hyperledger basu so we can build sustainable by design we can do it in the gaming context but i think the compute thing is a little bit uh, more challenging um, but it is something that uh, communities are thinking about and organizations, uh, there's a group called uh, Palm NFT Studio. I think as non-fungible tokens become part of the gaming environment, we might see a little bit more alignment with sus sustainable um, protocol choices of how we're, uh, how, wh what kind of platforms are running games on. Uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful because there, there are responsible and environmentally uh, sound um, uh, protocols out there. So thanks. I, I'm sorry I didn't think of that when you first asked. I think we're at time. Okay, well, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for your questions. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to describe uh, sustainability initiatives at the LF. Anna, thank you so much, too. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Nice to share our findings with you.